Coming up today on Studio 13 Live, we're giving you an inside look at Rough and Tumble, Seattle's first pub devoted to women's sports. Plus, we're sitting down with women in leadership at the Seattle Kraken, how they got to where they are, and advice they have for young girls and women. And if you need a boost into the weekend, Coffee Holic is here to show us how to make their amazing Vietnamese coffees. Then Water Grill in Bellevue is here to make some fish ceviche. Studio 13 Live on a Friday starts right now. I want to see you smile, take you another mile. Don't gotta wait, don't gotta wait, don't gotta wait today. Happy Friday, friends. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We're always so excited to have you. I'm Carly Henderson. And I'm Berea Garcia. Yeah, we got a party on a Friday, right? Oh, yeah, baby. We are going to have a blast today. But first, I want to take a second and talk about uh, all the fun that we had yesterday uh, during the Mariners opening day. It was it was the first time. Look at us enjoying that <laughs> Moto Pizza. I want to eat that again I right know, now. It was so good. But it was also the first time that we took the show on the road. And you know what, Carly? I cannot wait to do it again me too we might be doing it again too but it was such a blast being there you know that was my first time at t-mobile park and getting to see all the new gear getting to look around a little bit it was so fun kind of tossing to brian and having him show us other aspects like the diamond club and i don't know there were no fans there but the energy was really high in anticipation of opening day so. it was and we have to mention you and i are now tied in trivia because you and jody won hey! I was actually really nervous about what? trivia. You guys did great. I don't know. Yeah, I feel like we kind of redeemed. Yeah. I feel like both of us redeemed ourselves. Yeah, I think so. From, <laughs> from that other time, which we will not speak of. <laughs> hey, you know what, though? Country music fans, we got this one for you. Legends Dolly Parton and Garth Brooks are hosting the Academy Country Music Awards. And Parton says that she spent time with Brooks over the years, but has never really been able to work with him before. So she is just thrilled that during the awards, they're going to be spending time together. And this is ahead of her premiere of her rock album. We'll be hearing a single too, so that's gonna be exciting and you can catch that ceremony on May 11th. I love Dolly. Oh my gosh, I know, and she's 77 and she's just out there yeah. making new albums, hosting award shows. I mean, that's goals right Amazing. there. Amazing. Yeah, I wonder if her, because I know she's really close with Miley Cyrus. Yes. I wonder if they talked about their rock eras together and kind of helped each other and hyped each other have. up. They must have, they must have, because they are besties, yeah, I feel they like. Are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, speaking of country music, the CMT Music Awards are on Sunday. So some of the performers include Gwen Stefani, Car Carrie Underwood, Kane Brown, Keith Urban. Alanis Morissette is also going to take the stage oh. alongside a host of others to celebrate the 10th anniversary of CMT's Next Woman of Country franchise. Alanis thrown in there. I like that. What did you say? Alanis Morissette. Oh yeah, Alanis yeah, Morissette that's... and Gwen Stefani. Two people yeah. you maybe don't think of automatically when you think of country, but they could hold their own. They've dabbled. I think so. Yeah. It'll be exciting to watch. Yeah. And and speaking of watching things, by now I think we've all watched some or all of the show Friends before. <laughs> some, all. All, all many, many times uh, being a super fan. Well, Jennifer Aniston, who of course played Rachel, is speaking out saying that a lot of the current generation of young viewers is saying that they find the show offensive. And in a recent interview with Yahoo, the actress actually reflected on how comedy has evolved over the years. You know, people find different things funny. She says comedians today, they have to be very careful careful more than before not to offend viewers with their humor. Now, Aniston admitted that some of the jokes on Friends should have been thought through. I can certainly think of a few uh, <laughs> in the first and second season and maybe one that happens throughout the series. But at the end of the day, she says that there is a lot more sensitivity now. However, she said, quote, the world needs humor. You can't or we can't take ourselves too seriously. And you know, I think it is so important to really take stock of the things that we joke about, you know, as a as a community. But at the end of the day, yeah, we can't take ourselves too seriously. We got to laugh. Yeah. And part of humor is like laughing at the inappropriate things mm -hmm. that people sometimes think. Right. Yeah. But I, I just say, look at it as a time capsule. If you don't yes. like it or you're offended by it, don't watch Friends. That's fine. But like, I actually think it's good to look back and say 10. Is it 20 years now? Let's, almost? Not, let's yeah. not do the math. Let's not date ourselves. <laughs> That's decades ago. But yeah, um, it, you know, the humor has changed. We've even talked about this with The Office. And I oh, think yes. it's, it's a good thing that we're more sensitive to these things now. And it's a good that the shows wouldn't be made in the same way now because when we know better we do better and if viewers expect better but just 
don't think of it, don't think about it too much and just enjoy it for what it is right now and don't expect everything to stay the same and, and yeah. expect for it to change I think as it should evolve. It's also like almost a mental health issue to me, like you can't change the past. Yeah. And if you are in this mentality, whether it's a TV show or your own life where you're angry about the past and you wanna change the past, you are stuck and you're never gonna move forward. So I think we can take this like entertainment medium and really use it as an example for our own lives. And you know, like you said, Carly, if you don't like it, don't watch it. And that is really the simplest answer. 100%. All right, a parenting expert is speaking out against paying your kids for chores. I'm very interested to hear what mm -hmm. you think after mm -hmm. this. So she says that parents need to keep allowances and chores separate so that kids can develop a better understanding and respect for money. She says chores are something that kids should just do because they need to contribute to the household. Did you get paid for chores as a kid? I did not. I did not. Did you? I did once I was a teenager. Okay. So I would mow the lawn. We had a pretty big lawn and we had a push mower that was not automatically propelled. So it took <laughs> my mom and I both two people starting this mower. We would yeah. be, that was like the hardest part really. We would be out there for like 20 minutes trying to start this old junky <laughs> lawn mower. And I, it would probably take me, I wanna say like an hour and a half. I'd have my music blasting. I would mow this whole lawn and then I would get paid $40. And it felt like a oh, really good nice. deal. It felt like a lot as a kid and I really looked forward to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. What a, that's very nice. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing that's really interesting to me about this is, you know, in, in my time in journalism, I've, I've worked on a lot of parenting stories and I've talked to a lot of experts who uh, really recommend against yeah. paying your children for chores, essentially because you want to teach the child that being a part of a home, you know, being a part of that micro community means that you have to do things because it is better for the home, it is better for the family. However, <laughs> it is also important to teach kids that money isn't free, right? Yeah. So uh, from what I remember, the recommendation was that there are the standard daily chores that okay. everybody does as yeah. a part of the family, as a contributing member of the family. And then there's that thing that you gotta do a couple, like a couple times a month, like you, mowing the lawn? Like mowing the lawn, yeah. And you can get the paid labor, for that. The labor yeah. that you I think have to so. do. I like that idea. Yeah. I feel like the little like tidying up, like sweeping the floor, like clearing the table after dinner, I think that should be like, if I was a parent, I would probably try to, ex I would expect my child to do that. Yeah. Um, but it, it sh you know, having your kids like do the heavier cleaning <laughs> task, it is probably cheaper than a housekeeper. That is true. So if they, if they wouldn't do it, I would probably bribe them just to get them to do it. You know, if you I know didn't want to do it myself. Th that's fair. We're yeah. all out here trying to survive. So whatever you decide to do, good on you. Good on you. No judgment. <laughs> so an Australian startup company says that it has created. This is a weird one. Okay, you, I know that people have seen this video, but we got to talk about it. It is a meatball in a lab what? and it has ties to the woolly mammoth. What? I know. <laughs> so the company used genetic information from the woolly mammoth, spliced it very sciency style with the DNA from an African elephant which is the closest living relative. And then from there, researchers added some sheep's cells mm -hmm. which then multiplied and created this Chunky meatball that you see on your screen right now. Company owner says that his goal is just to get people talking about the importance of meat alternatives. Uh, so far, nobody has tasted this <laughs> apparently steaming meatball. Uh, <laughs> but Carly, you and I have had conversations, you know, of how how far along alternative meats have come. Yeah. What is your take on this? Yeah, I would say fake meats have come such a long way since I started, you know, being vegetarian yeah. in college. Um, and like starting with the beyond burger, moving on to the impossible burger, and then impossible chicken nuggets, indistinguishable from regular love chicken it. nuggets. So I feel like as the technology gets better and better, I mean, the goal would be for people to enjoy delicious meals without having to harm any animals, right? I used to love the taste of meat. I ate a lot of meat. I loved chicken before um, I became vegetarian. And then I learned about like factory farms and all those practices. I won't get too into it. You could look it up if you want to, but I just personally like didn't want to contribute to that anymore. So bring on the lab grown meat. I'm not like craving <laughs> Holy mammoth, but I think this is a great, you know, evolution, and I think there's going to be a lot more of this in the future, and I'm excited to see what's going to happen. I agree. I think we will be seeing a lot more of this in the future, and you know that I am a little creeped out by lab-created meat, but yes. you had me try some, yes. and it tasted the same. Yeah. It, it was ground beef, to be fair, but like it tastes, or faux ground beef. Yeah, yeah. But it, it did taste about the same. Now, the question is, <laughs> would you try that chunky meatball? Ah! Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> sure. Why not, right? Girl, I never got to meet a woolly too mammoth. Weird so. for me. <laughs> it looks disgusting, <laughs> but maybe maybe we'll have it on our show when it Maybe one comes. day. <laughs> yeah. We'll be put to the test there. <laughs> All right. For years, people looking for love have turned to dating apps, but now a company is pushing to get single people to stop swiping and get off of them. The goal is to get single people to wear a little green ring as a symbol showing that they are looking for love. Now the company behind it called the pair, called Pair Ring is hoping to encourage more real life connections. And the idea is that if people wear the ring, there will be no need for dating apps at all. The ring costs $26, that's not too bad. Mm. And if you have one, you get access to free events in your city. Do we think that people will really notice a green ring? Well, eventually, I would say, maybe not immediately, because, you know, this yeah. ring looks a lot like, uh, there's some, there's different brands, but the one I know is Kalo Ring, which What's is, that? it's a silicone ring that you wear on your ring finger if you're married, if you are in the exercise industry or you're working out a lot. Oh, so you okay. got a ring on you know, at the gym, for example. Okay. So it looks a lot like that, but I saw the model wearing it on their middle finger, so maybe that's a little different. I, I like the idea. Yeah, I, I like it too. It's just, uh, we've come so far along with uh, <laughs> online dating, I don't know if it's just gonna go away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel like the color could be a little bit cuter too. I don't know if green <laughs> is gonna necessarily match with everything, mm -hmm. but it is hard, you know, to approach someone and to yeah. know, you know, I think, I think most people wish that they could meet in the wild and it was a little bit easier. They wish that they could know if the person they were gonna approach in the bookstore or the grocery store was open and looking for love, so. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a little symbol. I think that we, there would just have to be a huge PSA, a huge campaign yes. to let everyone know this is we're happening. doing the single rings now. <laughs> I like it. All right, we'll see how that goes. We'll get this airline EasyJet just released its predictions for the next 50 years of travel. And that report written by Europe's leading futurists and experts in the world of aerospace innovation and engineering. So it's not just some guy, okay? Some of the predictions include your heartbeat being used as your passport. They would scan your unique heartbeat instead of using an ID. I like this one, plain seats that automatically adapt to your body shape, height, and weight, <laughs> and entertainment being beamed directly okay. uh, into your eyeballs. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty weird. That's pretty weird. I love how it's EasyJet too, which is a budget airline in Europe, right? They're like tiniest seats, telling yeah. us about all the future of technology. <laughs> I, I mean, that's cool and all. I'm not against it, but I feel like what I want is just being treated decently. When Can I'm I just flying. be a little comfortable? Be a little comfortable. <laughs> I do like the idea of the different size seats and yeah. all that, but I mean, we're fighting for like inches of legroom here. Is there, are airlines really going to give us that? Uh, well, I guess we'll see. <laughs> Maybe if you got the money. Yeah, we'll find out. <laughs> okay, still to come here on Studio 13 Live, it's time to check in with TMZ. Yeah, we have a major update on Gwyneth Paltrow's case. She's walking away with something from that major lawsuit. It is time to take a look at what is popping in the world of celebrity news. Yep, and for that, we are bringing in TMZ senior producer, Charlie Nav. Hey, Charlie. Hey, happy Friday. We made it. We <laughs> made it. <laughs> <laughs> it feels good. Um, well, after a week on trial, I know that this Utah jury gave their verdict in the lawsuit involving actress Gwyneth Paltrow over the ski crash that happened in 2016. Fill us in on those details. Yeah, so Gwyneth actually won her ski crash trial and was awarded by a jury $1. So $1. I'm sure you guys have all seen the footage from the, from mm -hmm. the trial. Uh, it's been crazy. But so basically a man named Terry had sued her back in 2019. He said that she was the reason for a crash that happened on the slopes in Park City at Deer Valley Resort. And he said because of this uh, ski crash that he had suffered um, some brain injuries, he had broken bones. He had a concussion, all this stuff. So he originally wanted to sue for three million. Judge at the time said, "Look, you can only get 300k maximum." So they had, you know, gone into court. Everybody kind of saw like all the facial expressions that Gwyneth Paltrow was making. Um, but yeah, so basically the jury got together, deliberated for a little over two hours, and they awarded. Uh, they basically said Gwen did not cause the ski accident. So Terry lost. Uh, Gwen did have a countersuit for $1, so she was given that $1 <laughs> or awarded that $1. Um, but what I thought was really interesting, um, after you know they made the announcement that the case was kind of like over, 
Gwen had walked past Terry and she had whispered something in his ear and everyone was like, oh my gosh, what did she say? What did she say to him? And we had found out from Terry's attorney that she had said, I wish you well, which I feel like is kind of like a Southern, like bless your heart a little bit. <laughs> yes, but absolutely. I mean, maybe she, maybe she had good intentions. I mean, I don't know, but that is what she said. So yeah, it's a wrap. <laughs> I'm sure she thought the rest of that statement in her head. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and Charlie, you know, Carly and I were talking about how somebody saying that to you after, you know, a big legal battle like this is almost worse than them being angry at you, right? Because they're very obviously being the bigger person. <laughs> yeah, isn't it so weird we get to watch yeah. celebrities trials go down I know. and then they kind of take on the life of their own with getting memed into TikToks oh. and everything like I yeah there's it's there's a whole <laughs> lot out there that, about this trial. Like, it's like the hottest ticket to be at like forget the Oscars forget the Grammys <laughs> everyone's trying to get in this courtroom yeah. and be a part of like you know where they have like the seats and stuff like they want to watch it they want to be there it's almost like a a life event that you want to say like I was there when it happened kind of thing so yes. yeah it took the world by storm <laughs> and speaking of legal battles okay Meghan Markle making news again and she is keeping her name clean okay a judge in Florida siding with Meghan Markle when it comes to a definite information lawsuit. Tell us about that. Yeah, so her half-sister, Samantha, had sued her for defamation over the interview that Megan did with Oprah. So I don't know if you guys remember, a lot of the headlines came out from that Oprah interview, but one part was about her sister, Samantha, saying that Megan grew up as an only child. She said she never really met Samantha, maybe a, a handful of times like throughout her life, but nothing really meaningful. Samantha saw this interview, didn't like that at all, had sued for defamation, said it was embarrassing, malicious, and all this stuff, but a judge threw it out. He said, no, it's just her opinion. He totally sided with Megan. Um, but yeah, I mean, she's obviously had a rift between her side of the family and then, of course, the royal family as well. So she's just kind of dodging bullets at this point, but definitely a big win for Megan in court. Wow. And you know that Meghan and Harry talk a lot about wanting their privacy, but it seems like they are not shying away from keeping their name clean. I mean, we saw that Harry made a, a surprise appearance of sorts in court uh, over in the UK. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he's also um, trying to he, he's a part of a case, and so is Elton John, basically trying to get media over in the UK to not be as vicious. He had claimed that they're, you know, going to the extremes to get information about him and about the royal family, that they're bugging his car, they're tapping his phone lines and all this. So, yeah, he's been, um, you know, not very vocal because he's not speaking about it, like, publicly, like, to paparazzi, you know, but he's definitely is taking a stand to kind of get those laws in order against the media. I'm sure it's the most annoying thing in the world for both Meghan Markle and for Gwyneth Paltrow to have to go to court or spend their time fighting these legal battles. They have to pay their lawyers, not knowing if they're going to win or not. But I really respect that they do it on just principle. principle. Yes, absolutely. The principle yeah. of the whole thing. Uh, yep, definitely. We'll see how it all turns out in the end. <laughs> well, we know you'll keep us updated. Charlie Neff, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, ladies. I'll catch you next time. You know, Charlie's always coming in clutch with all that information. We appreciate her for that. All right, still ahead, Coffeeholic House is joining us in studio. Yeah, we're going to learn how to make some of their special Vietnamese coffee drinks right after the break. Ooh, those look good. Ooh. Hello, it is time for Seattle Sips, where we highlight some delicious drinks in our area. And today we are joined by Chen Dean and Trang Kao, the owners of Coffee Holic House. Welcome. Welcome. Thank Thanks you. for having us. We are so yeah. excited for this segment. So Coffee Holic House, it's Seattle's first yeah. Vietnamese mm -hmm. coffee shop. Tell us about how it began and about yeah. all the locations yeah. you have now. Yeah, so we're Seattle's first Vietnamese specialty coffee shops. We opened during the pandemic in 2020, oh, and wow. we actually just hit our three years anniversary. Oh, this oh month. congratulations! Thank you. Happy yeah. anniversary! Thank you. <laughs> it's been a ride. It's been a journey, and we love what we do, and we're just very excited. So the reason why we start is because Chang and I are both immigrants from Vietnam, okay. and in Vietnam, the coffee culture is huge. It's like it ties with our daily routine. Yeah. But when we move here, even though Seattle is a ca capital of coffee, yeah. mm -hmm. but we cannot find anything that's similar to what we have back there so as 
entrepreneurs, we just think like, why not bring the amazing coffee culture that we grown up with yeah. and bring it here to our second home, which is Seattle, yeah. and introduce that and more of the Asian fusion flavor coffees to the people here in Seattle. That's wow. wonderful. Um, so it, this is really a lovely combination yeah. of two coffee cultures yes. coming mm -hmm. up with the perfect combination mm -hmm. yeah. here. So talk to us a little bit about that Asian yeah. fusion flavor that yes. you were referencing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we started, we know that it won't be something that just standard like Americano or drip coffee. Mm -hmm. We want to do something that innovated, something mm -hmm. that unique that people have never seen before. And yeah, so we base a lot of our drinks on the flavors that we grow up with, the ingredients that we grow up with. So example, like pandan, and there's like ube, sweet potato, Ooh, yeah. mm -hmm. and then yeah, we're just coconut. trying to, yeah, coconut, yeah. Mm -hmm. just try to make it fun, something unique that like we can bring to everybody. Sweet, yeah. what are we making today? Yeah, yeah, so right here, we have some Vietnamese coffee. Yeah. So this is how we use, uh, this is what we use to brew our coffee. It's like a pour over. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's strong, it's bold, it's just Very bold. Some liquid gold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> liquid so, gold, yeah. I like that. So we're gonna have two drinks. The first one is going to be Coffee Hot Dream, which okay. is like a best seller. Okay. And the second one's gonna be Purple Haze. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. let's get like started. Yeah. Lavender yeah. haze. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I love so, it. Let's start first with the coffee hot dream. Okay. So this one is going to. I like to add some ube drizzle, just make mm -hmm. it looks like beautiful, make mm -hmm. it looks fantastic. And then this is the Vietnamese coffee base right here. So we're gonna add that into the cup. And so that's coffee and what else is in yeah, the base? Yeah, so the Vietnamese coffee, just like drip coffee, which uh -huh. we have right here, and then some condensed milk. Oh, okay. That's cool. Yeah. Cool. Very strong and This bold. is going to keep you awake yeah. for two days. I'm yeah. ready. Yeah. I've already had a lot of coffee today. I'm not going to lie, but yeah. good. Bring it's on another. So yeah. good. <laughs> so what you guys see right here is a cheese foam. Ooh. So basically, we make this with real Philadelphia cream cheese. It's silky. It's smooth, just like whipped cream, but just a different texture. Mm -hmm. What a special and drink. Yeah, so she's going to top it up with some finished touch with the cocoa powder and some more of the uber drizzle. Oh, I love yeah. that. Beautiful. And then we love to make coffee look like an art. Yes. So, yeah, so this is what it looks How like. How pretty. Yeah, yes. thank you. Okay. You gotta give it a sip. And yes. while you're doing that, talk to us about mm. the types of beans that you yeah. use. So, so good. right here, that's what we have. So we are proudly use the coffee beans from Vietnam, grown in dialect Vietnam, mm -hmm. because we want to support the farmers back there. Mm -hmm. And we roast in Seattle and weekly so we want to make sure that it's, it's beautiful it is freshly roasted yeah oh my gosh this yeah. is such a dream Thank this you. is so good it's so strong yeah. like i like it but yeah. also such a fun color it just feels special yes. to hold and match your outfit yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let's make our second drink yeah let's do that Okay, so the next one is called Purple Haze, so mm -hmm. it's like ube latte with ube foam. Mm -hmm. nice. yeah. And for anyone who doesn't know what ube is, mm -hmm. we explain ube, it? Ube, I would say it's like a sweet potato. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Sweet purple potato, yeah. and then we make um, into the, the syrup, sauce. Yeah, yeah. into so the sauce. Mm -hmm. It's not like something that's like very fragrant or something, but it's like vanilla, it's like Asian vanilla. Yeah. Okay. Yes. yeah. And we're gonna start with some milk. Beautiful. And I like using oat milk. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then we're gonna have some of the syrups right here. So this is our homemade ube syrup. Okay. And it's vegan. Yep. So we're gonna add in there, give it a good stir right here. And Chan can help me to add some of the ice in here. Awesome. And yes. This is so fun, and I have Thank to say, you. like, all of these containers and everything, yeah. it's so yeah. cute, so Thank pretty. You. I love yeah. it's like the prettiest pour mm -hmm. over I've ever seen. Yes. yes. Coffee to our, uh, us is like an art. It is. Yeah. Oh, so and I think you can really tell yeah, with your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. So we're gonna add some of the coffee on top like that. Yum. Make it some layers. Look at that. And this one is <gasps> our ube foam. It's oh. our own creation as well. Yeah. So That's beautiful. We're gonna add some of that on so top cute. of this drink. And then we're gonna also add some ube drizzle because we can uh, never have enough ube, right? Fair Give enough. us more yeah. ube. <laughs> yeah. yeah, fair enough. There you go. <laughs> and where can people find you? Yeah, so we have three locations. Mm -hmm. The first one's gonna be in Columbus City, mm -hmm. and the second one's in uh, Greenwood, okay. and we have the third one's coming up in Bellevue. Oh, that's yeah. exciting. Oh, congratulations yeah. on that Thank art. I'm gonna you. give this a try. Oh yeah, so that's ube, there's mm. some coffee, there's some foam. Ooh, and, and it still has mm -hmm. that strong coffee yes. flavor, yeah. mm -hmm. which I need every morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And maybe a little 
afternoon, oh, too, no. you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This is fabulous. Chen and Trang, thank you thank so you. much for thank coming so in. Much. This was such a great time. Thank you so much. <laughs> and we've got a link with more info on Coffee Holic House up on our website, fox13seattle.com slash studio13. Thank you. Oh, thanks again. This was so <laughs> fun. Yeah. And coming up next, we are taking you to Rough and Tumble. Carly is Seattle's first women's sports pub. Yes, I got to talk with the owner about the why behind her business and checked out their incredible space. We'll be right back. In honor of Women's History Month, we wanted to share another story about women creating their own path. Enter Rough and Tumble, Seattle's first pub devoted to women's sports. It's in Ballard, and this is hands down the cutest sports <laughs> bar that I have ever been to. Jen, the owner, is really paving the way for women's sports to shine. Check it out. Jen, thank you so much for sitting down with us and talking to us all about Rough and Tumble Pub today. You're the owner, you're the founder. Give us kind of the scoop on how the story began. I'm a longtime woman sports fan. I love all the sports. And in November of 2021, OL Reign were in the semifinals and I couldn't find a place to watch them. And I just was really tired of watching them at home. Um, and if you're a woman sports fan, that's pretty much the only way that you watch women's sports because women's sports only get about four or five percent of sports media coverage. So it sounds kind of simplistic, but it was a light bulb moment and I decided to do something about it. And you opened very recently and you've been very busy so far. Tell me all about that. We have. Um, we opened in December. We're busy all the time. We have wait lists. Um, commonly have wait lists. We're booking events on a regular basis, which is really neat. Um, and it's just, it's, it's just been a huge success. Yeah, and how yeah. does it feel to be the first pub in Seattle devoted to women's sports? It's exciting um, and it feels like an honor, frankly. On a daily basis, all of us come into work and we feel like we're doing something good. Mm -hmm. We're doing something that is lifting up women and women's sports and advancing equality. We prioritize women's sports and we play all the sports. So we play the Hems and the Seahawks and the Kraken and um, and we play the Storm and um, oh well rain. Rock climbing competitions and skiing when it's that season and snowboarding and swimming and track and field. Wait, that's so cool. And that's such a good way to kind of raise awareness too about sports that people don't watch as much like rock climbing gets a lot less love and even like the Seattle storm I feel like underappreciated and need to be seen more so yeah I love that this is happening yeah do you want to show you. me around a little bit I'd love to let's do it come on <laughs> I'm obsessed with this space. One of the very first things I noticed was these big, beautiful windows and these plants, and it's not your typical sports bar. Was that important to you? It was. I worked really hard on the design here and the look and feel, and I wanted to create a space where everyone felt really comfortable. And, yeah. Um, I love a good English pub environment, yes. and I wanted to create something that was a little different. We have pool tables over here. Everybody loves playing those. This is an all-ages venue until 10 p.m. Okay, so not only do you have these pool tables, which might not be my strong suit, but I'm sure others are much better at them, um, I'm seeing a cool vintage photo booth. Tell I me know. all about this. I love this. So this is literally a vintage photo booth from the 60s and it's been renovated by a woman who does this um, because she simply loves it. I noticed some local legends right here from yes. the Royal Ring. Yes, this Lou Barnes, great. Jess Fishlock, and Megan Rapino. The OGs. Awesome. The OGs. The and you've got some jerseys here too. We do. Megan Rapino, this is her US Women's National Team jersey. And tell me about these oars. So this bottom one is actually from my alma mater, if you will, Green Lake Crew. I started oh. rowing there when I was 13. So this is the outdoor patio. We call it the patio space, but it's actually a four season portion of our dining area. Uh, it's got heated floors. It's nice and cozy. I can vouch for that. Yeah, it is. But then in the summer, these roll up and it becomes this huge open space. So what kind of drinks do you have here? <laughs> well, we have a full cocktail menu, which I love. We have some really special ones on there. Um, we've got this great tap list, though, and 17 taps, which I put in and I'm really excited about. And we've 
done, I think, a pretty good job of highlighting some of the women-owned breweries and cideries in town. That's so cool. Yeah, can I pour you one? Yes, please. Okay, do you want a cider or a beer? I want a cider. Okay. Yeah. So I really love this cider. It's from Yonder. Yonder is woman-owned, Caitlin Braun. Cool. Uh, and in the summer, we're going to be doing rosés with cider and stuff, too. Rosé! Say no more. I know. How is it? It's great. So I think it's time for some food. Yeah. So this is our famous beet burger. Beet with a T. Okay. I know. So it's actually vegan. Love um, that. And, and you have a lot of vegetarian vegan stuff here too. Yeah, we do. We have a really a pretty robust vegetarian and vegan patron base, so probably somewhere in the 45 to 50% range. And this beef burger has won three awards. Uh -huh. So we're really excited to share it with you. I'm so excited yeah, to try it. Yeah, bring you over here and yes. get you seated. <laughs> I am so excited to dive into this. It's this really good. So good. It is really good. Mmm. Right? So while okay. you're eating that, <laughs> one last fun fact. These tables that we're sitting at are actually reclaimed bowling alley. What? From Tacoma. Oh, yeah, there's triangles on I it. I know. That's, That's really wild. fun. Yes. That is awesome. It is really cool. I have a really good friend who's a woodworker and has spent a lot of time lovingly rebuilding these lanes yeah. into tables that we all sit around at, like these communal bar high tables oh, now. That's so cool. Does that mean? Yeah. I'm gonna finish this burger. This is an amazing burger. Thank you so much for having us here today. Thank you for coming in. This is awesome. Thank Keep you. Thing and uh, you guys should check this out. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Jen created such a cool space, and you would not believe all the different programming that they have on too. So for more info on Rough and Tumble, head to our website, fox13seattle.com slash studio 13 live. I I'm really, still dreaming of that yeah. burger. It looked delicious. It was, it was so delicious. Good. Yes. Oh my goodness. And the goodness. Yonder Cider too, that was, we actually filmed this before um, Caitlin it. from Yonder Cider came in here and gave us all the flavor. So I guess that was my first time I tried it. That's like my favorite cider now that too. That is amazing. Yeah. What was your favorite part of the whole experience? I think just looking at all the different thought that she put into every aspect of it. I, like, I thought it was so cool that the tables were made up from bowling lanes mm -hmm. and then just, I don't know, like a woman's touch in decorating a sports bar. Normally I think of them as a little bit darker and there was like those bright, beautiful windows so right. you could see people rowing, you know, in the water. That's amazing. It was, just, like, it was awesome. It feels really good in there. Yeah. Definitely check it out. All right, coming up, we are highlighting the amazing women in leadership at the Seattle Kraken. Yes, we are sitting down with a quantitative analyst and data engineer about what it's like working for the Kraken and their tips for young women pursuing a career in sports. We'll be right back. As we close out Women's History Month, we're highlighting the incredible women in leadership at the Seattle Kraken. And today we are joined by senior quantitative analyst Namita Kandakumar, and we are joined by engineer, data engineer Fiona McKenna with the Seattle Kraken. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Hi, nice to be here. here. It is a pleasure to have you here. Now, Namita, this question is for you. Tell us about your role and, and what a regular old day looks like. Sure. Well, I wish I had a more glamorous answer, but it <laughs> is a lot of sitting at a computer and writing code. What I think is really cool about it, though, is every day can look different in terms of kind of what questions we're being asked to answer. So sometimes I'm looking ahead, trying to figure out what models to build for the future. Other times, you know, it comes down from up top like, hey, should we trade for this guy or not? And so oh, we wow. are part of, you know, what goes into finding an answer to questions like that. Uh, and then also, you know, yesterday we had a Kraken home game. Today we're going to a junior hockey game. So plenty of hockey watching in between. <laughs> That's fine. And you both said you go to a lot of, or every home game, right? That's right. Living the dream there. <laughs> and Fiona, I know you're a data engineer. Tell us about, you know, your job and kind of how you got involved in sports. Sure. Um, so Namita's going to laugh at me, but um, I explain <laughs> it as kind of like, if you go to a library, I'm uh -huh. the librarian, so I organize and strategize how to organize the books, the data, and then people like Namita come in and grab the books and make new books, new chapters, whatever it might be with that data, and then we reorganize them and try to build on them, and hopefully these books and things we do with the data never existed before and helps us to make better decisions. That's really cool. Yeah. And did either of you play hockey growing up? Um, I did. I played for a long time. I played in college um, and a year of professionally as well after college. That's awesome. Oh, that's so exciting. So there's that connection there. Mm -hmm. And Namita, for you, you touched on this a bit, but talk to me about what it feels like knowing that you're providing the information that could change somebody's life. You know, is somebody going to get traded? Are you going to get a new player? That's wild. She has the power. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're a piece of the puzzle, but I will say it's a really cool feeling. And I think just goes to show like, 
how important it is to lean on analytics and decision making because there, there's so many decisions that happen over the course of a hockey season and you really want to feel confident that we're doing the best thing for the Seattle Kraken and I love that we get to be part of that. That's so cool. And Fiona, what's it like working for the Kraken and what's your favorite part about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an easy question in the sense that like every day it reminds me of like a sports locker room in all the best ways. Yeah. Because you have like, it's like a family and it's fun and I feel like I laugh every day, but also we work super hard. And then secondly, like we're, we're all working towards, obviously we want the Kraken to win, but more importantly, we want the sport of hockey to grow in the Pacific Northwest. So it's, it's awesome to go somewhere where everyone wants the same thing um, and have fun while doing it. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And now this question is for both of you. I think that when people think of professional athletics, there's this idea that it's only for a select few, but it is a business and you can be involved in many different ways. So what advice do you guys have for young girls or even women who are looking to get into this industry? Yeah, so I mean, the simple answer is just go for it. Like I look back and it, it's so funny to think about when I started out, like I never envisioned myself, you know, being able to actually attain this role, but I'm so glad that I just went for it anyway. Um, and I think especially with sports analytics, what's cool about it is, you know, if you try to get the skill set, like worst case, you just have a bunch of really important and useful skills that you can use <laughs> at any job. So I think, yeah, just go for it. And uh yeah, Sorry. go ahead. Um, I was going to say, for me, I think very simply, like, I, I, I think I kind of got this role because I messaged a really, really strong, powerful woman leader at the Kraken on LinkedIn and kind of stalked oh, her for I a bit. That. Yeah, for like almost eight months. And then when I actually got the opportunity to work under her and on her team, I took it and moved across the country because why not? So that's so yeah. cool. And like, way to, you know, be assertive and really go for something that you want to. Mm -hmm. Is there anything like you would tell your younger self that would help you prepare, like help prepare you for this journey and for this job? Oh my gosh, that's tough. I think I would just say like, be confident in who you are and just know that you know you have a lot of skills and a lot of information and a lot of value you know in this role and, and to teams and to just be confident in that mm -hmm. yeah. what about for you um i don't know i think that you know something i would tell my younger self is that the whole point of a job is to like more days than you don't so like find yes. what you yeah. which i think is rare especially when you get out of college and whatnot and not sure what you want to do so like once you find that which for us it's working in sports like stick with it because yeah. there's lots of different areas you can take it and i know like there's a little bit more of a push now with like girls who code and different organizations like that to push like women to get into this more uh, tell me about kind of your journey and getting into code and what gave you like the confidence to do that in such like a male dominated field sure i think you know as an undergrad um i was just trying to figure out like what really appealed to me and i think the way that i got into coding you know it, it didn't necessarily appeal to me immediately but what i love about statistics is we're basically trying to figure things out it's it's a research job i'm trying to learn more about hockey the sport that i love and code is the way that I get to do that. And so that kind of gave me the motivation to dig deeper and get some of those skills. That's great. And now speaking of working in male dominated fields, whether it's STEM or, you know, professional athletics, I think also majority male, talk to me about what it's been like for you to create space in a community that maybe wasn't necessarily initially made for you. Mm -hmm. um, I think at the Kraken specific specifically from the top down, whether no matter what gender the person is, they really support everyone. That's I think right. that's, I mean, hopefully it becomes less and less rare, but um, that's something that's, I think, very special. And so, like, from day one, I had people, or we have people who are way above us and with lots of experience who want us to succeed. Um, and I think for both of us, our team is um, led by a woman, Alexandra Madricki, and, like, I mean, she's a, she's a beast. She's a star. So <laughs> yeah. learning from her, I think, provides, like, a path for us to grow and feel confident female or male, it doesn't matter. And last question, uh, what's it like working for such a new team? Because this is the second season for the Kraken. Oh, it, I mean, it's, it's so cool. I would say it's a dream come true, but I never would have even dreamed of something this cool. Like, as Fiona said earlier, it's so amazing to, you know, obviously want to win hockey games, but also look at the growth of the sport around here, like be able to walk around and see people in Kraken jerseys, like, and feel like we were a part of, of building that and creating that fandom. It's just, it's amazing. Absolutely. Well, you both have the coolest jobs. Thank yes. you so much for coming in here and <laughs> telling us all about them. This is all great. Right. All right. Still ahead, Water Grill opened its first location in the Pacific Northwest in Bellevue. Yeah. And in just a few moments, I'll be learning how to make some fresh fish ceviche different than what you've seen before. We'll be right back. I
Hello, it is time for Emerald Eats, where we highlight some amazing food in our area. And today we are joined by Kaylin Sparks, the executive chef at Water Grill Bellevue. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, we are so excited to have you here. Now, Water Grill in Bellevue opened in Lincoln Square, December of 22. Is yep. that right? Okay. Yep. And, you know, first in the Pacific Northwest. So talk to us a little bit about the restaurant. Uh, well, we've got locations uh, all throughout uh, Southern California and even into Las Vegas, where we have a water grill there. Uh, and the whole idea with the, this brand and company is we want to highlight the products from the ocean, and we try to do it pretty simply, right? Because we feel like if you get good products, like don't manipulate it too much. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing goes for our whole fish program. We curate it, uh, and we pull these whole fish in, and we monitor them in-house, and we prepare them a couple different ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, one of ours that I'd like to do today is one of an off-menu item. We don't put it on there normally, but if you are in the know and you talk to your server and say, I want this ceviche, uh, then you're going to get one of our one of our best dishes. Ooh, I love that. A little secret info for viewers of Studio 13 Live. So talk to me about what makes this ceviche different. Uh, so we do it as a whole fish preparation, and typically when you get a ceviche, it's been marinated for, I mean, a good amount of time, you know, an hour or even farther. So the fish is almost fully cooked. We do ours and it's kind of a, almost like a crudo. It's, it's practically raw and then we dress it with a fresh lime juice and olive oil dressing. Does that mean it's sort of cooked because of that acidity or not really? Not really. Okay. Yeah, the acidity will cook it over time. And of course, if we leave it on the plate, you know, it's gonna do its job, but we like to get it in front of the guest before it's even had that time to really soak into it. Beautiful, so right before the show, we were chatting and I was saying, so it's kind of like severe but also a little sashimi because it's right. very fresh. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So talk to me about what goes into making the ceviche. Uh, well, so I brought some ingredients here. Um, the first one that's most important is the fish. Uh, mm -hmm. So we take it off the bone, take it off the skin, and so we have our fillets, and then we'll set our fish head and fish tail aside because that'll be part of the plate. Uh, and so I've got some segmented limes in their juice here, cilantro, some Fresno chilies, mm -hmm. shallot, a uh, little extra virgin olive oil, and then some micro cilantro from our friends at Farm Box Greens. Oh, a little fun. shout out to Dan over there. He yeah. started in West Seattle. Hey, Dan. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> um, and so uh, then we'll, we're going to mix these together and assemble it on the plate. Uh, the first thing we want to do is, is take our knife and cut our fish. What kind of fish is this? Uh, so this is a pink bream. Mm -hmm. It's my suggestion for what to do ceviche. We'll offer any of our fishes uh, in the ceviche prep. But I think the pink bream is the best one because it's got a very mild and sweet flavor to it. It's not something that's super overpowering. Uh, and so it lets the rest of the ingredients shine as well. Beautiful. Yeah. Now, what is next? Well, next, so we've got our handy bowl here. Mm -hmm. And we're going to take our lime juice with our lime segments. And we're going in. And then everything is going to make its way in here. Some cilantro. Now tell me, why did you choose to include kind of some of that pulp of the lime in there as well? Uh, well, so two reasons. One, because it's going to give you like a little pocket of flavor, mm -hmm. and then also it looks very nice on the presentation. Yes. Oh, right? Okay, we, we always got to be thinking in a couple different directions there. It's not always just what tastes good on the spoon, you know? <laughs> You know, I try to make it look nice at home, my friend, but it doesn't always turn out that way. So I'm glad you're teaching us how to do it. <laughs> well, on camera, no less, right? <laughs> and then we've got our olive oil, and we're going to add that in, and we're going to make a little vinaigrette out of this. Oh, beautiful. So we'll move our garnish here. Okay. So while we've got that in the bowl, we're going to take our fish and get it arranged. And the way we do the plating on this, we kind of try to make it look almost like the whole fish so mm -hmm. we'll take it in here kind of shape it and that's where our tail and our head come into play mm -hmm. and so when the guest sees it they still get their entire whole fish wow wonderful yeah. now while you're mixing it up here tell me what do your guests have to say to their server to get this item oh just ask for the ceviche yeah. it's pretty ceviche. simple yeah okay. and, and we'll do it with multiple preps like we'll also bring in uh ludomare or branzino mm -hmm. uh as it's commonly known i've got one of these guys here okay uh, and that's another great option for it. Beautiful, wonderful, okay. Now, while you're still working on this, we have a beautiful presentation here that you guys set well, up. Thank you. So walk me through some of the other items that you have on your menu. Great, yeah, happy to. Our, our most popular uh, 
presentation by far is the grilled, mm -hmm. uh, and for that we'll take it, split it off the bone, butterfly it out, mm -hmm. and then char grill it in our grill. Oh, okay. We keep our grill at about 1600 degrees, uh, so quite hot. Okay. Uh, so it gets on there and we rip it for, you know, maybe two, three minutes at most and it's done. It's ready to go. Wow. Uh, and then we'll finish that little olive oil and caper. Uh, here, this is one of my favorite preparations, uh, and it's the escabeche. And it's got uh, carrots, fennel, some peppers, cooked down with orange dressing, and baked in the oven with a little bit of lemon and thyme. I, it's, that's my favorite preparation for it. Um, but, but honestly, the most popular by far is our grilled one. Beautiful. And you yeah. also have a very extensive uh, menu for other kinds of seafood, oh, huh? Tons. Yeah. yeah. Our, I mean, our raw bar is uh, something I like to feature a lot. We keep mm -hmm. 16 different oysters on there. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. We partner with Taylor Shellfish, Hama Hama, and Baywater up here. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a nice way to get this local product onto the menu in front of guests. Beautiful. Um, and it's, it's huge. I mean, just speaking from the numbers, because I, I see that on the next day's sales, uh, about 15 to 20 percent of our sales is just from our oyster bars. Wow. Yeah, That's and how so, you know the people love it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And, it, it, you know, for seafood, the, you know, the freshest you can get is raw and still alive. That's uh, awesome. And so, yeah, we like to keep the oysters and clams, and we'll have our live urchin there as well. Beautiful. All right, let's plate this up so I can give it a try. We Great. have a little less than a minute left at this oh, point. Oh, well, you know what? We're at the quick part. So yes. we'll take our lime dressing here, and we'll just start to kind of spread it out, and we want to make sure that we are coating it. Mm -hmm. Nice there. And so Amazing. we'll finish it with some Fresnos. Ooh. Just a little spice in there. Nice. That is amazing. I cannot wait to try. I'm ready. Yeah. A little I'm bit of our curious. micro cilantro, just as a little garnish here. Beautiful. And the last two steps is some fresh cracked pepper. And I got a little bit of this sea salt here that will go right on top. Beautiful. All right. What, where do I start? Just wherever I want? Uh, yeah, get in there where you can. I hope you don't mind if I grab a oh, fork and join you here. Please do. Oh, beautiful. All right, well, I'm going to try this delicious, amazing fish. I want to toss it over to my bestie Carly over there, and you're going to say goodbye for us. Yeah, thanks so oh, much, girl. Uh, have All a right, everybody, uh, don't day, forget everyone. if and you have a restaurant or bar that you think we should feature on the show, definitely let us know. Studio 13 Live at Fox.com. Thanks for joining us. Go out and make it an amazing day, an amazing weekend, and we'll see you Monday. Bye. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh,